morning for our scripture reading from the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 a short and sweet scripture this morning in those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered and this is the first registration that was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria all went to their own towns to be registered Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and from the family of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. <clears throat> About 300 years after the time of Jesus, we had Emperor Constantine the Great, the famed ruler over the Roman Empire. It was him who eventually made the edict to stop religious persecution throughout the empire, and he also made Christianity the official religion. Scholars like to debate how he became a part of Christianity, whether he found Christ little by little at pieces in his life, or if he was perhaps a secret Christian early on, and only much later went public with his faith. Whatever his journey is, this much we do know. His mother, Helena, was certainly a woman of faith. She made a huge pilgrimage, building churches as she traveled throughout Europe, throughout what is now called Turkey and then the Middle East. Eventually, she made her way to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And I have to let you know, Amanda and I have very similar Google abilities because I am going to be quoting from this exact article in National Ge Geographic from 2017 by Simon Morrill and said, oh, that's the exact same thing because I did not know that about the aqueduct. But he noted that Bethlehem may have been just a small collection of villages, but what it lacked in size, it made up for in importance. Bethlehem was a particularly fertile area known for growing almonds and especially olives to make olive oil. This was due to the water source that was set up there. The aquifer and the, wa the water source that was there was called the aquifer. When the water in the nearby Jerusalem was compromised and polluted due to animal sacrifice, they turned to the small village of Bethlehem, whose water was famous for being bountiful, clean, and better tasting than any other water around. Just south of the city are three major reservoirs, which became known as Solomon's Pools. They're still around to this day. The name Bethlehem translates from Hebrew as the house of bread. Bethlehem is the place where Rachel, the sister of Leah and the wife of Jacob, was buried. It's there in those fields where Naomi will return in disgrace and destitution with the foreigner and widow Ruth the Moabitess. They return to Bethlehem and Ruth will begin gleaning wheat from the friendly fields of Boaz eventually turning themselves into a courtship and a marriage that will redeem both Ruth and Naomi. Bethlehem is also the birthplace of Jesse and his sons, including a shepherd boy named David. It's in that small village where he will be crowned the king of Israel. This is the place that Helena will journey. The bishop of Caesarea escorted her, and it showed her the place where the last 200 years pilgrims had gathered. She found a small cave, and there that had been placed there a ceramic manger, or a little feeding trough, where people had come to worship Christ. Many of the destinations that Helena would research had been lost in the hundreds of years and in the times of persecution between the time of Christ and her journeys. Entire cities had been leveled or almost lost to time. Many of the places where the miracles occurred had been almost undiscovered, lost. But thanks to her research, they were found again. However, Bethlehem was not a place where there was need for extensive guesswork. It was at this place, in this small cave, an extension of the rock that made a natural shelter from the elements that a family had a home. And it was here that Helena set out to build a church. Today, that place is called the Church of Nativity, and it's located on the West Bank in Palestine. The cave is known as the oldest site continuously used as a place of worship in Christianity. 
and the Basilica is the oldest major church in the Holy Land. This cave has withstood the test of time, even though the church itself has burned down multiple times. The cave survived. It also survived several major earthquakes and untold political instabilities in the area. When I got to go and see it in 2020, something that stood out to me in seeing the church was the entrance. In this massive basilica, as you were going in, you could see the door, and it was about four foot tall. And I thought, how tall were people back then? But this was actually something done on purpose. The intention behind it was to give the pilgrim the invitation to lower themselves before entering into the holy place. It's called the door of humility. At this place where Helena was shown the manger, today there is a silver star embossed on the floor. It's tiny and quiet and dark in that room, lit only by lanterns. And it's here at that silver star where the pilgrims will line up, sometimes waiting hours for an opportunity to see the place, to pray at the spot where everything changed. During normal years, the city of Bethlehem will have in between two and three million visitors, even though there are less than 30,000 people who reside there today. Back in the days of Jesus, 30,000 people in the city of Bethlehem would have seemed quite insane. It has grown in 2,000 years. But its importance throughout scripture, even as the little town, could not be overstated. All of these things happen in this tiny little nothing town called Bethlehem. In between the Old and the New Testament, there are approximately 400 years that pass. Some scholars refer to this time as 400 years of silence, as the people await a new prophet, await a word from God, and they wait in silence, sometimes patiently, and sometimes, like all of us, not so patiently. That word will arrive, not in the great temple, or even in the holy city of Jerusalem. It doesn't arrive in the capital of the Roman Empire at Rome. The word instead arrives at the modest village outside of Jerusalem, the house of bread, the place where the freshest and cleanest and best tasting water around could be found. The place that everyone knows about, but no one suspects. The place where one of mo the mothers of Israel will re find her rest. A place where an outsider, a desolate widow, found redemption, and in doing so, she found her place to be the grandmother of Jesse, the great-grandmother of a shepherd boy who would become King David. For centuries, Bethlehem was known as the place where the forgotten could be found again. Those who were stricken with grief could find new life and a second chance. It was a place where humble beginnings could produce kings after God's own heart. The little town of Bethlehem. And so, after the 400 years of silence, it's on that night in Bethlehem, as two weary travelers arrive in this tiny but mighty city, and something big, something powerful, and yes, something mighty takes place. A mother gives birth to a baby boy, there wasn't room for them to stay, and so they stayed where the animals were kept, and the feeding trough becomes this newborn baby's first crib. A humble city with humble people. A humble start. There's no wonder in my mind after you're entering the Church of Nativity why you're expected to stoop over, to bow a little bit in reverence in order to get in the door. It's pretty clear the message that God is sending us by picking Jesus' place of birth to be this particular city, the town of Bethlehem. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is not only for the high and mighty. He's accessible not only to those who live in the city with all the big amenities, 
Jesus is not only for the rich, for the smart, for the successful, for the powerful, for the beautiful. Jesus arrives in a state of helplessness. And in that moment, hope arrives for those who have felt powerless and hopeless for a long time. In being born in Bethlehem, Jesus fulfills the prophecy of having a royal lineage. And yet he still has a little bit of the opportunity to fly under the radar. Because who pays attention to little old Bethlehem? And being born in this sleepy town, it reminds the world that it doesn't matter where you come from or where you've been. God is alive and well in the hearts of the lowly, in the hearts of the humble, of the ones who thought maybe they weren't good enough or fancy enough or famous enough. God arrives and angels begin to serenade in the stables and the fields as it gets the attention of both the rich and the poor. The wise men from the east see the star and they begin to travel towards this incredible sight. But the angels singing out in the fields also attract the attention of the shepherds. The smelly, the broke outcasts who weren't ever allowed to go into the temple because they were always considered so unclean from their dirty jobs. The ones who sleep outside. They are the ones who hear the angels. They make their way to the place where Jesus is. Who could have ever thought that the Messiah in all the world would call out to the dirty and poor shepherds? But then again, who could have thought that a young, poor shepherd boy from this same area could ever be chosen and anointed as the king of Israel? Who would have ever thought that a despicable Moabite, the hated enemy of Israel, would ever have been ushered into the fold and given a second chance? And generations later, the baby born in that same city would seek out the least and the last and the lost, the despicable, the outcast, the rejects, the widows, the outsiders, to call them, simply to redeem them in the same way that Ruth was redeemed, to give them a second chance. Who would have thought that the burial place of one of the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel, the chosen people of God, would have descendants who would soon blast open the doors of who could be chosen by God. That it wouldn't matter what family you were in, who your parents were, or what you had done. All that would matter would be to have faith in the same baby born in Bethlehem who would go on to turn the world upside down. The city of Bethlehem does have a rich history that many have overlooked. But God makes it clear that being humble can bring you far more power than being arrogant. That you don't have to be a, to have hosted kings in order to be worthy of the Messiah. Simply put, the greatest news of all comes for everyone. Not just the rich, not just the powerful, but even the dirty shepherds even the small town folk, even the outsiders and the lowly get to be a part of this story. The ones who needed to hear the good news most are the first ones able to hear it proclaimed. Have you ever felt just a little bit different on the outside looking in? Have you ever felt like maybe you didn't belong? then the story of the baby being born in the city of David is for you. Have you ever wondered if you weren't good enough, or important enough, or smart enough, or simply felt like you weren't enough? It's a pretty defeating feeling. It's a feeling that God sets out to correct, that God makes clear time and time again that all are worthy. All are enough. That this is a story that hearing that we aren't enough, this is a story that is filled with lies and deceit. It's not 
the truth of the gospel. Because the greatest gift of all arrives in a little small town to the poor parents who's put their baby in a feeding trough to help keep him warm. You don't have to have certain credentials or a degree in order to be enough for this baby, the Son of God. Because he is enough for all of us. He is worthy enough for each and every one of us. We don't have to fret about being enough or being worthy because he simply arrives in our midst. The answer to prayers, the hope of the world. There's no way for us to buy it. There's no way for us to earn it. It's simply poured out for each of us. Phillips Brooks was the author of the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. He was the Bishop of Massachusetts in the 19th century. He wrote the hymn for his Sunday school class after visiting the city of Bethlehem in 1866. The tune was by Rafe Vaughn Williams, and it's a hymn that talks about the unexpected coming to the sleepy and silent town, making all the difference in the world. I particularly love the second verse, which says, for Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above while mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth, and praises sing to God the King, and peace to all the earth. His message to them and to us was clear. Great things can come from unlikely places. I find it so incredible that this miracle of Jesus' birth unfolds to a shockingly few number of witnesses. The baby is born, the shepherds and the angels are celebrating, but everybody else in this tiny town is sleeping in their beds, unaware that the greatest miracle of all has arrived, unaware that the 400 years of silence has ended, that God's voice will be resounding in generation after generation and after generation that God's voice will never be silent again. They don't yet know that God himself was closer to them than they ever could have dreamed or imagined. How could they have possibly known that the gift of eternal life was currently fitting inside of a manger? Redemption was right next to them, waiting to be revealed. All by mortals nearby sleep. The gift arrives. The third Sunday of Advent is about rejoicing. It's about reveling in the fact that Jesus does arrive in our midst, no matter how much we don't deserve it, no matter how unworthy we think we are. <clears throat> Jesus comes to us, all of us. It doesn't matter if we're wide awake or we've been sleeping. It doesn't matter if we've been wrong or right in the past. All that matters is what we do with the joyous gift before us. No one is excluded from the joy of the newborn king. No one is left out in the cold. No one is turned away. Not you. Not me. Not anyone. Everyone is invited in. That's something worth rejoicing over. This week, as we take a spiritual journey closer and closer to the manger in the city of Bethlehem, I want to issue us all a challenge to find joy in the humble things, in the ordinary things, to give thanks for the things that others might take for granted or overlook. What humble blessings lie in your life? As I woke up yesterday morning to the news of those massive tornadoes over the Midwest, my list of blessings that I was thankful for grew exponentially. And then came next, the reminder and the conviction that grew in my heart that sometimes rejoicing means more than just saying thank you. Rejoicing also means sharing our blessings, especially in times of darkness, in times of need, for others. Joy is not something that we can share in alone. Joy must be shared. 
just as the shepherds shared their joy. Joy flows from us towards others. As we light that third candle, the pink candle, the candle of joy, may we remember that this is a flame that we are entrusted not to keep to ourselves, but to share, to fan so that others who might be lacking in joy, for others who are fear, feeling fearful, are lonely or sad. Joy is not something we can enjoy alone. It must be shared. Just as the joy of the birth of Jesus in that humble little town doesn't stay in the little town of Bethlehem, our joy too must burst out at the seams. It must be shared. How will we share the good news? How will we share the good news and the glad tidings of great joy to all those around us? To the least, to the last, to the lost, to the destitute, to the poor, to the outsiders. How will we fan this flame of joy into something that spreads to everyone that we meet? Today, let's rejoice that no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, the joy of Jesus can be ours, and it can be shared with everyone that we meet. Let us pray. Lord, help us to be humble during this time, to lay down our pride, to lay down those expectations that we have, to simply enjoy the gift that you give to us. In the same way, we know that being humble doesn't mean unimportant. That being humble doesn't mean we can't find great joy and great power. You come to us leaving behind your majesty, leaving behind everything that could have been to be with us. We are so thankful for your gift. Help us to be filled with your gift of humility, with your gift of joy, and fan that flame into something beautiful that can be shared with everyone. Help us this day. We pray these things in your precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I now invite us to stand and res respond with the words of the, our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. And the words are found in our bulletin and in our hymnals on page 881. Let us declare together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What child is this? And as we sing this hymn, we open up the doors of the church. If you're feeling a call in your heart to give your heart and life to Christ or to unite in membership here with us at First United Methodist Church, I invite you forward as we sing this hymn. We'll be so happy to greet you and receive you.
being in God's house as we lift high the name of Jesus together. We'll see you this afternoon at the famous Christmas concert. Fran, these, this tongue gets away from me, and I, in my mind I said, we're going to say the famous, and I did not. And it did not come out that way, and so I didn't mean it that way. And I love you. I'm sorry. It's a long revoked day, and at 5 o'clock, it's a But we know it will be wonderful. I'm so excited. This is my first Christmas concert, so I'm thrilled to be able to be a part of it. So I'm excited, and we hope to see you there and at the reception that follows. Next week will be at the fourth Sunday of Advent, and the message will be one of us as God comes to be with us, in us. And dwelling within us. Go now in peace and enjoy in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.